I am no historian. I'm just going to use materials from a source. Uh, and this is a book uh, called A History of Christianity in Malaysia by John Roxburgh, who used to teach at Seminary Theology in Malaysia. Most of what I have in this presentation at least comes from this book, but I have augmented it uh, with some of my own material. Having said that, I would say that at least 80%, if not more, uh, are from this book. So I don't make any claim to originality in what I'm saying here. And I want to be clear that I'm not taking credit for someone else's work. Um, the outline, I have a little outline here so that you have a sense of where we're going to be going in this presentation. We begin, of course, with the introduction. Then we talk about the period before the Portuguese. And one of the things that you'll notice on my slides is sometimes I'll circle, I'll circle things in red. And what that means is there's a point of connection with India because Portuguese were also in India. Then I'll speak about Roman Catholicism in Malacca because we, of course, have a fairly large Roman Catholic presence here, relatively speaking. Then we have Catholicism under the Dutch. There was a period uh, when they were repressed by the Dutch, who were, of course, Protestants. Then we have something called the Strait Settlements, which some of you may have heard of. Then we'll talk about the Strait Settlements and Sarawak. The reason we have to talk about this is because we're actually a country in two parts to get to the other part. So we live in West Malaysia. To get to the other part, which is East Malaysia, you have to fly for two hours. So it's, it's a pretty unusual country from that perspective. You have to cross the uh, South China Sea to get there. Then I'll talk about the Treaty of Pangkor, which is very important for understanding the situation in Malaysia. I sometimes tell people that in India, after independence, you had no more royal families. I think you had over 400 royal families or something like that. After independence, you had no more. In Malaysia, uh, when we became independent, uh, and to be strict, to be, to be correct, I should say it was Malaya that got its independence in 1957, we actually added one royal family. So it's a very strange situation that we have in Malaysia. We have the nine that we already had then, plus one more. So a bit weird, but that's how it is. And it's partly because of what happened in India in 1947. Uh, they, the rulers in, uh, in Malaya saw what happened to the, to the Rajas in India, and then they said, oh, no, we have to protect ourselves. So something happened there. Uh, and so you are partly responsible for <laughs> our situation in Malaysia today. Then I'll talk about the Japanese time. Uh, and then I'll talk about the return of British rule. Uh, and finally, emergency, independence, and beyond. It's complicated, but we'll try to keep it simple. So there are some important dates. So 1511, so if you come as a tourist to Malaysia and you go to Malacca, 1511 is an important date because that's when the Portuguese arrived. And that's the beginning of the colonial era, which went all the way up to 1957, when some people say that the colonial masters basically changed from being in London to being in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so some people say we're still a colony, except that we're colonized by some of the elites uh, in our own country. By the way, uh, one of the reasons I introduced the book at the beginning is to say, uh, whoever is listening, understand that what I'm saying is something that a lot of historians accept. Uh, I won't go into the other dates because I'll cover them as we go through. But it's complicated because we have Malaya, we have Singapore, we have Sabah and Sarawak, which are in East Malaysia. And then we have China and India. Why do I mention China and India? Because we have a massive Chinese population, a massive Indian population in Malaysia today. And then in terms of ethnic groups, we have the indigenous uh, Malaysians. Uh, these are the Orang Asli, the native peoples. We have early traders. We have Malays uh, who claim to be the uh, original people. So they say they are the Bumi Putra, the sons of the soil. Uh, and this is somewhat contentious because historically, uh, at the time the Portuguese came, uh, they were, the Malays were actually concentrated uh, on, in the coastal areas. Uh, and of course, they were in the coastal areas because they came from somewhere else. But this is again very contested. Then we'll talk about the churches. We'll talk, go all the way from uh, mainline churches to free churches. 
uh, schools, seminaries, literature, uh, talk a little bit about Bible translation, and something called New Villages, which are very important for understanding uh, race relations in Malaysia. Then, of course, we'll talk about the various faiths. We have the animists. Uh, I think there's a more politically correct term nowadays, autonomous, opto something or other. I can't remember what it is. Then we have atheists, Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Muslims. So we have the whole array of people here. Now, before the Portuguese, 16th century Malacca developed into the most important trading port in Southeast Asia. Malacca was very, very rich. It was one of the wealthiest places in the world. Some say it's like the third, third wealthiest city in the world. And so you had traders coming, you had diplomats, travelers, and you had Nestorians, uh, Catholics, Armenians, all kinds of Christians came. But they're only mentioned uh, in, in like small remarks here and there. We don't have any surviving monuments or anything like that. So it's hard to write that side of the history. The, um, there is a, a, a yellow triangle, a, an upside down triangle that you can see in the top, top left uh, of this map. And that indicates the location of Constantinople, uh, which fell in 1453. Uh, to Muslims. So that was the end of the Byzantine Empire. And all these lines that you see there are the trade routes. So you have the red lines, which are the silk route, and then you have the blue lines, which are the sea routes. And what happened when the Muslims uh, took control of that area in, in the Middle East is that they cut off the trade routes and they monopolized the spice trade. Spice trade is very important in the story of Malacca. Then you have uh, what happened is the um, passage through the Cape of Good Hope. So Bartolomeo Diaz uh, discovered it in 1488. Uh, and that resulted in expansion. And the Portuguese in particular, you know, went over to uh, Southeast Asia. And that was the beginning of the conquest of Southeast Asia. But like I said before, they started with India. So they were in Goa first. So on the 24th of July, 1511, Alfonso de Albuquerque, accompanied by Franciscan and Dominican monks, this is important, arrived in Malacca and basically booted out the previous empire, took the wealth, put it on ships and sailed away with it. Uh, and they began to control the port. They weren't really, so they often talk about guns, God, and glory. A lot of historians talk about Portuguese as being guns, God, and glory. But actually, the Portuguese weren't that interested uh, in God. I mean, they were enemies of the Muslims, and they wanted to knock out the Muslims. That was very important to them. But they didn't really work on that when they were in Malacca. In fact, they basically just looked after their own people. So when they set up the church there, it was to look after the needs of the Catholics who had come uh, on the ships. But some Chinese, Indians, and Malays were converted by marriage. And the important thing to notice here is that the Muslim traders basically abandoned Malacca and moved to Aceh. Now, Aceh is, is important. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why, because you would have heard about it in the tsunami. So in 2004, in the tsunami, Aceh was basically wiped out. And, and this photo, okay, in, in this map, you see where Aceh is. It's in the uh, northern tip of Sumatra. Uh, and between Malaya, the peninsula, and the island of Sumatra is the Straits of Malacca, a very important trade route. All the spices from the east had to go through there, which is what made Malacca so important and rich. And Aceh is where these traders went, the Muslim traders went. And it is also where there is this string of mosques that they built, but actually the, the solid mosques, which didn't get washed away uh, in the tsunami, were built during the Dutch period. And they had very good foundations and so on. But the uh, Muslims of Aceh basically said that the tsunami was a judgment of God uh, on them because they didn't follow Sharia laws and so on. And then they became even more ardent in their pursuit uh, of kind of a fundamentalist, strict Islam. Um, now, I want to talk about Catholicism and the Dutch. 
one of the important things uh, to realize is that when the Portuguese took over uh, Malacca, the Achenese uh, and also the people of Johor, because the ruler of Malacca fled to the southern state of Johor and they kept on attacking Malacca. And then the Dutch came along and they also wanted to attack Malacca. They wanted to take control of Malacca because it's such an important trading port and the Dutch wanted to control it. And very important here is that the Dutch made an alliance with the empire of Johor and said they will not interfere in any religious or cultural affairs. In other words, the Dutch had no interest in propagating their Christian faith. They were just traders. The only thing that they were interested in was trade. The other thing that they did was they outlawed Catholic worship in Malacca. So these are very important. And this eventually resulted uh, when, when, the, when the Dutch came and they conquered in 1641, this resulted in Malacca basically losing its importance because remember the Achenese had already left uh, and then there was all this stuff that was going on and the purpose of the Dutch was basically to knock out Malacca so that Batavia, which you now know as Jakarta, would become the center of the Dutch activities. A little information here about Bible translations. We are famous uh, in the world because this is the one country where Christians are forbidden by law from calling God Allah in our uh, in the written translations of the Bible in Malay. However, the Indonesian Bible that we have used for centuries uh, uses the word Allah for God and also local translations. That's why you see this thing circled in green uh, on this chart. And that basically talks about the 1733 translation of the Bible by a man called Lidecker. Uh, he actually finished 90% of it about 20 years earlier, but then he died and then somebody else had to complete it, which is why it says 1733. And what's interesting is that the, the only, I think the first uh, Bible to be translated into an Indian language. I may be wrong in this, but my research seems to indicate that it was Ziegenbalg, uh, the German, who translated the Bible into Tamil in India in 1728. So five years later, there was a full translation of the Bible into Malay uh, that was actually, and these are published, okay, these are printed ones, so full Bible printed. Uh, and the Tyndale Bible, the first English Bible was of course 1526. Now I want to talk about the Straits Settlements. So what happened was then the, the, the English began to arrive. And in 1786, this man called Francis Light, of course, you know, is a Christian, uh, very nominal, but he's regarded as a Christian. And he came and he acquired Penang from the Sultan of Kedah. Like I said, we have nine sultans today. And he made a promise that actually couldn't be kept. I won't go into that. Uh, then in 1795, something really weird happened. The Dutch had to go and fight the Spanish uh, and in, in Europe. So, and, and you had the, what they call the Napoleonic Wars. And so the Dutch said to the British, can you please look after Malacca for us? Uh, we'll come back and then we'll take it over from you. And the British said, yeah, 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 sure. But remember, this is, as far as the general population is concerned, this is an agreement between two Christian parties. Uh, and so they left Malacca in the hands of the British, and the British basically destroyed uh, Malacca. They knocked everything down, and they wanted to move uh, all their trade to Penang and Singapore because they acquired uh, Singapore in 1819. Again, too much to go into here, but there's an important treaty called the Treaty of Pankor, uh, which is kind of like central because it was the way in which the tin mines were developed and the way in which the British basically began to gradually take over uh, the control of the Malay Peninsula. Uh, people ask, you know, how did the British come in? Because as I told you before, you had a war, the Dutch came to, sorry, first, first Malacca, the Portuguese came to Malacca and there was a war. Uh, that was in 1511. And then in 1641, there was the uh, Dutch and there was a war and things were destroyed and so on, there were forts. How about the English? How do they come? Well, there was no war. It was through diplomacy. Uh, it was through alliances and so on. Uh, and so through treaties. And the Treaty of Pankor resulted in the British having 
a say in the way in which many of the states were run in return for protection for the sultans. So the sultans were basically able to maintain their prestige and power thanks to the guns of the British. So this uh, was a period when, again, the British were really only interested in their own people. So they had churches that were set up for the expatriates. And they didn't really work on mission or anything like that. However, uh, there was something called the Anglo-Chinese College that was set up. And this was by the London Missionary Society. And what they began to do was to start training people, Chinese people, in Peninsula Malaysia, which was then known as Malaya, in preparation for uh, the entry of the gospel into China. So even as far as the British were concerned, Malaysia or Malaya at the time was just a stepping stone for China. And this is where you hear about the Ultra Ganges mission. The Ultra Ganges mission is something that is called Ganges because of the river Ganges in India. Uh, and what they wanted to do was basically prepare uh, for the day when that edict in China that kicked out all the foreign missionaries would be ended. And so the Ultra Ganges mission people came over via India, but of course they were British, and they set up colleges and did their training and so on, so that eventually they, should, they could go into China. Uh, so again, there is a connection between India and Malaysia. The next period that I want to talk about is Strait Settlements and Sarawak, and this is from 1842 to 1874. Sarawak uh, didn't actually become a, a part of uh, Malaysia until 1963, but Sarawak is important because of the way in which Christianity entered uh, Sarawak. In 84, 1841, there was this British guy called James Brooke, he was given Sarawak by the Sultan of Brunei because he had helped the Sultan quell an uprising and so on, and again, helped the Sultan remain in power. Uh, and one of the results of this is he's got this land, this was his reward, and he had this goal because he wanted to end headhunting. How to end headhunting? Bring in the Christian missionaries, encourage them to do mission work, because you know what, Christians will put an end to headhunting. Uh, that, and so that's how they came, the missionaries came. And this is very important because actually two thirds of the Christians in Malaysia live in East Malaysia, not in West Malaysia. So it's kind of odd that, you know, the person talking about the history of Christianity in Malaysia is someone from West Malaysia, not from East Malaysia, when in fact the majority of the Christians are from there. One of the responses to the, the activity of Christians was an Islamic revival. But there were also other missions that were formed in this period, and I, I don't have time to go into all that right now. So I want to talk about the Treaty of Pankor and the Japanese invasion, because what happened with the Treaty of Pankor is that you had these advisors that were appointed, like I said earlier, and they began to infiltrate and control all the economic policies. Uh, and even they determine who would be sultan, you know, so those who supported the British would be sultan, and they would be called Raja. Uh, and in fact, the sultan of Johor was called Maharaja. Where do you think that term came from? Of course, from India. Um, many, others, many other groups started coming in. You even had the brethren that came in, you had Methodists, and you had American money arrive. So you had uh, Americans with, and so the Methodist Church is actually very strong uh, in Malaysia, partly because of that. And also the British set up schools, uh, many mission schools were set up. There were, there were Tamil missions, Chinese missions that were set up by the, the foreign missionaries. Like I said before, the British stayed out uh, of religion. And in fact, there was this agreement between the British uh, and the rulers that Islam would remain the province of the rulers. A lot of historians argue that the British actually protected Islam. So Islam has a very special position in Malaysia from the very beginning uh, of British intervention in Malaysia. Why was there all this interest? Why did they want to have the Panko Treaty and so on? 
because it was the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution had begun and Britain was so eager to receive rubber and tin. They needed rubber and tin. And the British discovered that rubber could grow very well uh, in Malaysia. The climate was very well suited to it. The soil was well suited to it. So the British started bringing in, no, before I tell you the, the rubber story, I should tell you the, the tin story. So this great need for tin, but the local people, of course, uh, didn't want to uh, work for the British. They said, you know, we're already so happy. You know, we have a good life. We have our chickens. We have our vegetables. Why should we go and work for you? Uh, so they didn't want to work. So what did the, the British do? They brought in these coolies from China. So hundreds of thousands of coolies were brought in from China to work on the tin mines. Then they, the British said, okay, now we want, to, we want to develop rubber. And again, you know, the locals didn't want to work on rubber plantations because you had to cut down all the forests. You had to build roads, ports, railways, all kinds of things need to be done. So what did the British do? They brought in laborers from India. And this is why you have so many Indians in Malaysia. In fact, uh, I'm told that until recently, the largest concentration of Tamils outside of Tamil Nadu, I should say outside of Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka, the largest concentration of Tamils was uh, in uh, Malaysia. But apparently because of the exodus uh, of Tamils from uh, Sri Lanka to Canada, there are a lot of them there now. Um, so you had them arrive and it was a very sad time uh, because, uh, and I wanna show it to you through these uh, photos. Uh, what you see on the left side on the top, uh, and these are very old photos, so you can't get very clear images, but look at the, the top photo on the left side is tin mining. This is basically open cast mining uh, and also palong mining, shooting water uh, and so on, um, high pressure water. And what you have in the bottom is opium smoking. And you know how important the opium trade was how opium was grown in India by the British and then you know, how it destroyed the economy of China. Well, you had people become so addicted to opium because they had to work so hard. And what was the only comfort that they had? It was opium. Then you have uh, on the bottom, uh, bottom right uh, of the photo, you have the rubber tappers and you can you know, recognizably Indians, uh, they're Tamil workers. And they're the ones who were working on the plantations. And their conditions were so bad. You know, so many of them died of disease, starvation, snake bites, uh, attacked by animals. Uh, malaria was a huge problem. And they, were, they turned to toddy. And so what you see is, a, is, a, is some depiction uh, in, in kind of cartoon form of all the families that were broken and this is a little later because in the beginning, it was only men who came. So it was huge problems. And all this is by the colonial British Christian oppressor. So this is important to remember about us. Uh, the, the British never succeeded in uniting uh, Malaya. So what we had was something called the Federated Malay States and the Unfederated Malay States. Too much to go into here. But basically, they never managed to uh, unite it until the war. So it was only after the war that it was united. And who united the country? It was the Japanese. Uh, when the Japanese came, basically the Japanese, you know, we like to say they landed on the East Coast and they cycled through and the British ran away. Uh, because the British never imagined that the Japanese would uh, overrun uh, Malaya. So they were defeated. And the first thing the Japanese did was they united Malaya. They basically controlled all the sultans. The sultans basically were made to live uh, in their own uh, kind of enclosures. Uh, and the Japanese united the country, which is why in the, in the earlier slide, you would have, you, you, you would have seen, uh, you know, like names like Johor. Johor is the name of a state and then you have federated Malay states. Whereas under the Japanese in the stamps, it's just Japanese for Malaya, okay? So united, it was the Japanese who actually united all the states. The Japanese time was a terrible time for the country. There was mass torture, killings of the Chinese, 
why were the why did why did the Japanese attack the Chinese? So you know they used to like line them up and shoot them. There's something called the Sukching massacre. Uh, if you go to Singapore, and I'll show you in the next slide, there's actually a monument to that. But they were attacked because the Chinese in Malaysia and Singapore were supporting the Chinese against the Japanese during the invasion of uh, China by Japan. And when the Japanese came, they took it out on the Chinese. Tens of thousands of Chinese were tortured and shot to death uh, in open fields, mass graves, all sorts of things done. Um, and the Indians were basically sent, the vast majority of them were sent to go and work on the death railway, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, they, that was in Thailand. So they went to and, and they, they were under the worst conditions. Tens of thousands of them died there. Uh, and it, it was just caused, it caused great hardship. Um, and you see that here, uh, that there is a, a memorial to them uh, in uh, Thailand. Uh, and then you have this something called the Sukching Massacre. You can go and look it up. Uh, but tens of thousands of Chinese were killed. This is in Singapore. And on the photo, so on the right side of the slide, uh, what you see, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, there is a monument. There's actually a monument in Singapore that, that uh, speaks about this and, and you know, memorializes this. There is no monument anywhere in Malaya or Malaysia uh, commemorating the terrible things that were done to Indians and to Chinese. Uh, in the Japanese period. Uh, this, so the, the denial of the Japanese period in the telling of Malaysian history is a very sore point uh, with Malays and Indians uh, in Malaysia. Because to tell that story would be to say that, in fact, the Malays were collaborators uh, with the Japanese. And that's a fact, they were. Um, because they saw it as a way of being rid uh, of the British. So the story, uh, the story of Malaya, the Japanese period, is told very differently in Singapore and in, uh, in Malaysia. If you go to the museums in Singapore and in Malaysia, you'll see this in a very striking way. So when the Japanese war, when the, when the Second World War ended, the Japanese you know, were, were shipped off. Uh, basically, the local church had to continue the... Um, uh, had to take over the, you know, basically said to the foreigners, hey, we managed without you, now we can run our own churches. Uh, and they had to, you know, the, the church, the local Christians also had democratic, democratic aspirations, right? So what happened was all the political parties started forming. Uh, we had, and, and if you look at the names of our political parties, uh, you have one called AMNO, the United Malays National Organization. So race-based, uh, Malay Party. Then you have this, uh, the green uh, uh, with a white circle, that is the Islamic Party, so-called Islamic Party of Malaysia, also Malay dominated. Then you have the Malaysian Indian Congress, and you have the Malaysian Chinese Association. So we are very riven uh, by ethnic divisions, and these are race-based parties. And then you have this rocket symbol there, uh, which is the main opposition party, uh, which is the DAP, the Democratic Action Party. I have not indicated uh, anything after 2003 because now we have many other parties, including one called PKR. Some of you may have heard of Anwar Ibrahim, very important figure uh, in, in the recent politics in Malaysia over the last 30 years. Uh, but again, I don't have time to go into that. Um, so what happened during the, uh, after the, um, when the Japanese left, we had what was called the emergency for about 10 years. And this, again, really significantly affected the Chinese. 450 new villages were formed. But these are basically, uh, you know, like concentration camps. People were forcibly moved. The Chinese were forcibly moved from all the places that they were farming and so on. And they were put in these camps with barbed wire and fences uh, because they wanted to cut uh, the support that the Chinese were providing to the communists because the resistance to the Japanese was by the Chinese who were uh, basically participants in the 
uh, Communist Party of Malaysia insurgency against the Japanese. And then when the Japanese uh, were defeated and they left, the British basically said, let's go back to status quo. And, and the communists said no. And then uh, the communists went into the uh, jungles and they were termed uh, terrorists and so on. You know, big, big story. Again, I can't go into that. But half a million Chinese were displaced. And they basically had to live in curfew conditions uh, and, and they had to check in and check out of these uh, camps, all sorts of things. Anyway, that, that emergency kind of ended. The so-called bandits were, were dealt with uh, and the emergency ended in uh, 1958. Um, then in 1969, we had something called the race riots that resulted in something called the new economic policy, uh, which again is very, very race-based. Uh, and you can't talk about anything in Malaysia without asking the question, whom does it affect most? You know, who benefits most from it? Is it Malays, is it Indians, is it Chinese? And also like that. During this period, uh, the Christians uh, also were you know, very inspired by the Church of South India, which was formed in 1947. It's like a union of all the churches, um, but we never succeeded in doing that. So we're very fragmented here in Malaysia. Uh, we don't really have that kind of association here. Now, since it's such a big story, I just want to give you, if you want to, if you want to look more about it, uh, Gerald Templer is very important. Uh, and the way in which we got our independence is told in this book by Leon Comer, a uh, rather old book, uh, but it tells the story in very vivid terms. Uh, and in the middle is, of course, a new economic policy because it's central to everything in Malaysia. And we still have that in place. Then we have a very important book by Elizabeth Goldsmith called Against All Odds, because no one really expected Malaya, Malaysia to succeed, yet we have survived all these years. Uh, and Elizabeth Goldsmith is, um, you know, the Goldsmith family, she and her husband were missionaries here uh, in, in Malaysia. Okay, so I've gone through all that, a lot of stuff I've covered. Uh, so that's just an overview of what we talked about. Uh, and tried to keep it simple. I hope it wasn't too complicated. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of layers to this story. 